We're going. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about negative harmony again. Oh yeah? Again? Okay. Um, Ernest Levy doesn't actually use the term negative harmony in his book. Yeah. Could you explain more about the concept with an example or two? So, ne <laughs> so negative harmony, uh, it's funny, everyone's like freaking out about it. It's, it's hilarious yeah. for me, but um, what Ernst Levy lays out in his book, A Theory of Harmony, is the idea of, pol of like polarity. So something has, you know, for example, one note has an overtone series and an undertone series. Mm -hmm. And essentially, if you flip the overtone series, what you have is the inverse of what that tonality feels like in its most natural state. So if you flip every interval in the C harmonic series, rate rising, you get like, I can't hear a low C today. It keeps going up. So you have an octave, then a fifth, and a fourth, then a major third. If you go down, if you flip that, then you get an octave and then a fifth, so you get F in C and then C, and then a major third should be A flat and then F, and then a really flat seven should be like a sharp, a sharp D kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because like, yeah, harmonic, the harmonic series is in, it's in nature, it's in physics. And I guess the idea, in the same way that like when a tree grows, there's branches that come up and then there's roots that go down. What Ernst Levy essentially talks about, and then his ideas are extrapolated by this guy, Steve Coleman, um, a sort of a fairly visionary thinker in, in terms of music theory, is that Symmetry, as he puts it, symmetry is one of the most natural things to music that exists. And, and I think Steve Coleman talks about this idea of rotational symmetry, which is like transposition. Um, and then another kind of symmetry, actually I can't remember, which is essentially like you flip it over the axis. And there are a number of different axes that, uh, 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 about which you can flip a chord. And the one that Ernst Levy talks a lot about is the, is the fifth, so between C and G. And the fact that essentially, if I, if you, if you rotate a scale around the axis of that interval, then you get the equivalent gravity to the center of the key, but from the opposite side of the of the, of the circle of fifths. So if you look at the circle of fifths, um, as I'm sure you'll add in later on. So <laughs> yeah. C, let me see, C G D A, and then C F B flat E flat. Um, and so if I have a D major chord, for example, and I flip it over the axis of C and G, the rock star axis, then that D major, basically everything major becomes minor and everything perfect becomes plagal. So D major becomes B flat minor, because B flat is the same distance away from C about the axis on the circle of fifths, and the major becomes the minor. So B flat minor is similar to, to C. It has, has, the same, has a similar amount of gravity to C than D does, um, because the F sharp in D wants to rise to a G, naturally, and in the same way that the, the D flat in B flat minor wants to sink to a C. So all it is really is a way in which you can gain access to more sounds. And once you have access to the sounds, I guess it's important to say that sounds don't mean anything until you decide to use them in emotional ways. And so I personally treat negative harmony not as something that I sit down and study and study and study, but more as something from which I can squeeze out more stuff, more sounds. And once I've got the sounds, you know, like weird, play, like minor plagal cadences as opposed to perfect cadences, that just gives me a, a more profound palette. and. When it comes to harmonizing a melody, it might be that some of those sounds fit, and for that reason, negative harmony has its has its purpose, you know. But um, yeah, the, the man who taught me about negative harmony is called Barak Shmuel, and he learned it from Steve Coleman. And Steve learned it from a whole multitude of different places. But the people that Steve learned it from were, were using it before they were talking about it. And I think it's a, it's an interesting thing with talking and and articulating things. I think sometimes people think that the articulation is is the whole of the thing, but. Steve plays this stuff, you know, he doesn't talk about it, he plays it. And Ernst Levy's book about, about theory, it's, it's, kind of, it's intended to be composed with. So these people would think about it for a while, and then after a while, you know, it's not like people are going to try and only make negative music. <laughs> but sometimes they might reach a point where, to be more emotional, they'd flip the, the, the polarity towards that key center, and, you know, and in that way, it, would, it, might, it might be a, a more satisfying harmonic choice to use a minor plagal cadence or whatever. One more thing I say about negative harmony is that the way Steve Coleman describes it is as a, it's like as a melodic concept, not as a harmonic concept. So he talks about the idea of flipping C major. Um, and if you look at C major, in, like intervallically, it's a tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone, tone, right? And if you, if you flip that over the axis of, of C and G, you get, instead of do, 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 you get do, 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 right? So it's kind of like G, I guess, G Phrygian. Um, mm -hmm. He would call that C negative major. Um, and what that is, is 
the, you know, it's it's flipping C major intervallically speaking about the about the axis to the key center where all of the intervals are in the opposite position, um, and tonally speaking, it leads to it leads to an equivalent place. Um, so, I've always had this massive crush on harmony, and I think you have to. Um, so I was really drawn to the harmonic possibility and the, the potential of this idea, um, but you can use it melodically with as much effect as as harmonically. Um, and yeah, just n negative harmony, I, I guess, really caught my attention when it was mentioned to me by, by this guy Barrack, and, and so I really squeezed it dry, you know, yeah. found as many sounds as I could, and after that, move along and, and keep making the stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. Tuning. What's the purpose of using different tuning? Right, interesting one. Um, tuning. So, put your hands up if you think the piano's in tune, first of all, and then some people put it on the hand, and then I say, well, it's not. Right? Because the piano is equally tempered, which means that all the semitones are the same size. Um, and this was actually, I think it was implemented by, by the church um, about four or five hundred years ago. And, and the church didn't want to fund instruments built in every key. Yeah. Um, and so equal temperament came about. And, and thank goodness it did, because a bunch of jazz harmony cannot exist in just intonation. But um, essentially, just intonation is a key tuned to the harmonic series of, of that fundamental. So if I tune a C major chord with a justly tuned third, then the E in a C major triad is going to be about, uh, I think it's 14 cents lower than on the piano. Um, if I were to demonstrate that for you, which I cannot um, with one voice, the purity of that sound, it's like, you know that feeling when you sing a fifth and it's so unbelievably in tune, like, if you ever, like, you know when you sing, can we sing a fifth? So sing a note. Do. Yeah, and there's like a bit where it like it stops beating. It's just like you just like hug each other. Mm -hmm. um, that feeling with a third is just so glorious, and basically the third just kind of disappears in the chord because it feels so natural and wonderful to the chord. Um, I yeah, I guess I realized I had a sort of epiphany a few years ago that um, that chords sound better when they're tuned to the harmonic series, and so I endeavoured to always tune stuff to the harmonic series um, by ear because obviously auto tune won't do that for you. The sad, the sad case of auto tune. So um, yeah, so I, I lower all of my major thirds, I lift all of my minor thirds. Um, sevenths are crazy because a, a, a naturally tuned uh, flat seven in the harmonic series is about thirty-one cents flat. So like, ooh, 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 like that's really flat, really flat, and. The amazing and exciting thing when it comes to that is that I can then treat that B flat as a new route to a chord and the whole axis of the tonality drops by 30 cents. And so if that's the route, then I've moved my A from 440 to like around 432. And it's a really interesting thing to do to tune something in a, in a just way and then to essentially like swing as if you're like a monkey. You kind of swing, everything swings like that to that new place. Um, that thrills me a lot. Um, but you know, I think it's it's just it just sounds better. That's the the bottom line is it sounds better. There are certain chords that aren't possible in just intonation, like a six nine chord, for example. Because if you tune E in C major down fourteen cents, and you want the A to be in tune with the E of fourth, fourths are actually two cents too big on a piano, and it's to tune them justly you, you sink by two cents. So that would be from A if C was zero cents different, then E would be minus fourteen and A would be minus sixteen. But if the A is in tune with um, with if, if I rise in fifths from C, if I go C, C, G, D, A, yeah, and the A is in tune with the D, which is in tune with the G, then the G needs to rise two cents because fifths are two cents too small. Um, so you get C is zero and G is plus two and D is plus four and A is plus six. So you can't have an A that's plus six and in tune with the minus 14 of the E third. So you, it, you just can't do it. Like it's like game over. Um, there are ways you can get around that like by, like, by panning them to different ears so that they don't interfere, but it gets kind of confusing. Um, but, you know, I think that tuning, tuning systems, like something tuned in just intonation, that's, that's how a major chord should sound. Like, people should know that feeling of being a third in a major chord that sounds pure, because it's like so life-affirming. Yeah. Speaking of 432, why did you start Hideaway in 432? Um, for me, D at A432 is... is is like it's indoors, and then A440 D major is like it's outdoors, and in some ways. So I, I wanted to start that song, really, I want to bring people right into the room, and I think that the ear leans into A432 in a, in a different kind of a way than it sits and listens to 440, partly because mm -hmm. of what we're used to, right? So yeah, it begins in, in A432, and by by the end of the first verse, you're, you've risen to A440, and, and you don't notice, oh, unless it's you, obviously. Um, and so, yeah, I, I actually, I did something quite clever in the sense that the melody which goes doo doo, right? If I were to justly tune that F sharp 
in the chord of D major, that would be 14 cents flat. But instead what I did is I kept that third, I, I lifted that third up a little bit from where it is in A432 to make it slightly more equally tempered, which means that that, acts, that major third is a, is a traditional major third, an, an equally tempered, so it's a minor third, A to F sharp. Mm -hmm. And that's the right size, which means that the whole axis can lift, could lift to tune that F sharp justly to where it is in A440 if that makes any sense. So that at, at that moment is quite magical because everything just shifts up, but it's it's like a psychological feeling of rising, you know. It's you start in this in this careful place and you're, you're just underneath the surface of like the, the horizon or something. And by the end of the song, you're def you've definitely come out and you feel like you've been released. And so I don't know, it was something I wanted to try and and I, I enjoyed the sort of like cuddle, like the the Ionian cuddle at the beginning of that song and at the end, the Ionian cuddle at the end. Like if you flip between the two they're really different because the end is like and the one that begins like but I, that's kind of emotionally what I was trying to achieve I guess with that song How do you build a groove and why do you build grooves with uneven uh, uneven subdivision? Interesting groove um, so I guess in the same way that I find it a little bit unsatisfying to have all the semitones the same size sometimes um, to have all of the divisions all of the subdivisions within one beat the same size is it can be a little bit um, limiting and obviously quantizing has its has its place. Quantizing being when you play a bunch of random notes not quite in time and you hit the quantize button and they all go perfectly in time to the grid, um, and and that is fine. In the same way that auto tune can be okay, you know, in certain for certain kinds of music. But for me, a lot of the most exciting grooves um, in the world have, you know, the the, the divisions are, aren't necessarily straight. So if you take samba for example, um, you know. That is not straight, man. You know, mm. but and and similarly, there's a, a kind of music from from Morocco called Gnawa music, um, and they have they have a, a similar kind of uh, kind of grid, and they have one in, in three divisions, which goes like and if you slow that down and, and incrementally work it out, then just for my own sort of pleasure of working at speed, I, I guess that's four three two. In the sense, it's like uh, four three two, yeah, four two three, four two three. Yeah. And that's actually the groove that I aimed for on in my room, because um, that's a funky groove. That's not quite straight. Um, I think what it does to the groove is it adds. This feel, it's like it adds an additional momentum. It like adds a momentum on on an alternative axis to the axis of harmony, you know, or or moments in the song where the section changes. It's it's a new way of of generating sensations. Um, if every beat rolls like an egg, it, it just for me it makes me want to keep listening to it in in a different kind of way. In the same way that there was that like neo soul fad, right? <laughs> Like close to you. Yeah, right close to you. Yeah, I was I was guilty of that. Um, and yeah, what it is is like the second division. If there are two divisions, it's just nudged forward, and everyone freaked out. Like, oh, how can we theorize this? And yeah. I was part of those guys, so I theorized it in a number of ways. So you can split the beat into five, you know, and then have three and two. So and you can split the beat into seven. So four, three. You know, um, there's a whole host of ways you can divide a beat up, um, but really, like if you look at the, the fundamental reason why that feels good, it's because I think it's because things that are straight and organized and regular. It's not really the way life is. It's not the way the world works. Um, that works a lot more. In it's, it's 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 a bit more flexible. And I think that if you listen to somebody deliver an idea in a very very regimented way, or if you listen to somebody sing or play in a very regimented way, part of that for me. Um, isn't necessarily as kind of vulnerable or open as if it has space in it where things are wonky. Um, and being a sort of lover of, of information and emotion, sort of in equal terms, I, I thought about why, why that is. And yeah, so grooves in three divisions or four divisions that are wonky just make me happy. I think. Um, uh, but yeah, there was there was definitely like a lot of excitement when, you know, D'Angelo released that album Voodoo and it had a bunch of wonky grooves on it. And and I think that I've seen an interview with Questlove where he just says, oh, you know, it's like play drunk. Play drunk, like that's that's all he thinks about, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there are definitely ways in which you can achieve wonks um, by theorizing, you know. So like, there's that bit at the end of PYT where I do that five and seven thing, right? Um, 
So it's like, yeah. Whatever it is. Because um, I wanted to try and do that where the, the beat stretches to accommodate these new divisions. You know, when you, when you divide one beat into, into four or five or six or seven. Um, I actually, I invented a, a new terminology, a, a new sort of way of writing out um, time signatures where, you know, you know, you'd normally have like four, four. Yeah. And, and I, I figured there was a number missing at the top, which is like the number of beats within each beat. Oh. So, you know, you can have 4-4, four, four, but you can have like 5-4-4, four, four, where it's like... And then 7, like 7-4-4. But it's still in 4-4. Four, four, you know, so that bit in Hideaway, for example, in the second verse, when the, the metronome is at 49 BPM, really slow, and then the beat is divided into five. So... And then the shakers are doing threes. Mm -hmm. They're doing and for me, that's like an extension of that rolling like an egg idea, I guess, because you know the threes resolve every now and then, and then the mandolins are actually doing fours. They're going so they resolve every now and then as well. But then you have the kick and the snare on you know, one, two, and, and then a snare on four. So, you know, anybody's ear can hear there's a, there's a pulse, but I wanted to hide these, these delights of, you know, different rhythmic things in there, and, and it was fun. On the harmonizer, you sometimes do this really funky stuff. What do you call that, and why do you love doing it? There's something in production called sidechain compression, and it's how a lot of pop music works. And what you do is you compress something. So compression is essentially when you look at the dynamic range of something and you compress it so that all of the loudest things are slightly quieter and all the all the quieter things are slightly louder to squeeze it in. I think that lots of people's psychologies are very compressed in 2017 because their attention spans are so small. And so lots of ideas in the foreground is, is very reassuring for people. Um, those poor ideas in the background are neglected sometimes. but. Anyway, I, I digress. Uh, sidechain compression in pop music is a lot of the time people sidechain all of the synths and all of the, even sometimes the vocals and a lot of the, a lot of the sort of harmonic content of, about just the kick drum. So if you have like or something like a chord and, a, and then you have like essentially what happens is that every time there's a kick drum, the dynamic range increases. And so to average out the dynamic range, everything else needs to sync. Um, I realized quite soon after making the harmonizer that that's possible just by going I just do it manually you know um, and it makes people jump up and down yeah um, and it's 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 pretty fun I mean it's the thing about the harmonizer is anything you can sing you can harmonize so if you can sing such chain compression then you can harmonize such chain compression and especially if you add really low notes it, it like you know it can rattle a room especially with good subs you know you know like Skrillex type stuff it's, yeah. it's fun do you remember playing Crazy She Calls Me with Jamie Cole? Oh, I remember that, yeah. Sure I'm crazy, crazy in love am I. Yeah. And the set of chords you played there really struck me, particularly the voice leading. Yeah. How do you combine the vertical nature of chords with the horizontal nature of voices? Oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, so Bach is the master of this, right? Bach with his with his four part chorales, um, where the chords can all be understood vertically and functionally, but every single melody in in, in the chord is has has momentum and has motion. Um, I guess it's something that as a piano player I had to struggle with a little bit because at first as a piano player it's so easy just to go like bundle of notes, bundle of notes, because they're all there in front of you just waiting yeah. to be played. Um, and it, yeah, it took a little bit of time just to be courageous enough to not play them all at once, and that's something I've I'm still learning, but. Um, I think that when it comes to voice leading, as long as you sit down and concentrate on each note having a place to go, um, then then I think then I think you're safe, you know. And obviously, last time we talked about microtone of voice leading, which is like a, a sort of hyper extension of of effective voice leading, because a lot of the most effective voice leading is like chromatic. Um, so, you know, triads moving side by side, that's strong. <clears throat> The bass line having a strong motion, that's really strong. And then you can have bi-triadic voicings where you have a triad on a triad on a bass note. So if you have like, uh, like that's like an F sharp major over an E major over a D. So that could be like C super, super, super ultra Lydian if you wanted to say it like that. But also it's the reason it's strong as a voicing is because triads are strong and 
if this is if the motion of the bottom is strong and the motion of the top is strong, they don't even have to be going to the same places as long as they're both strong, and as long as you have the foresight to know that when it, when it, everything resolves, F major for example, it's like, ah, oh, we're okay, we're in F, like it's all okay, and it doesn't matter what you do to get there, as long as the motion in every part of the voicing is strong. But I guess one thing I think about is you can split a voicing into into different zones, and each zone needs to have a strong motion to move somewhere. So. You know, if the bass line is going do 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 do, then the triad on the top can be moving in the opposite direction, which is something that Bach, Father Bach, sort of likes to do. It's contrary motion. It's very strong, um, in the sense that a triad has a strong enough nature, and you know, voicings with fifths in them and thirds in them is you know, these are really strong voicings because if you look at the harmonic series, going back to what I was saying about that, um, the triad, like the reason why triads are so apparent in our culture in our western musical culture is because it's the first sound you get in the harmonic series that has that kind of tonal bias you know like the the, the major third is is profoundly f like physics it's physics so a triad in our ears just sounds like something that should be it, it, that that should exist you know um yeah so triads that move you know there's that thing in, in, in gospel music where a lot of the time you can harmonize just with two triads from from the scale if, if you take the triad of the one so in c c mm -hmm, and the triad of the two mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you can go like Does that make it sound? Yeah. Like Like that thing is nice because every motion, the motion of every one of those three notes is sound and lovely. Um, and so knowing that, you can maybe do something utterly different with the bass, you can go in a completely different direction, but watch your momentums and watch your voice leading for that reason because all you need is strong motion going in a certain direction and they might they might not be all equivalent but that's fine you know yeah yeah what were the chords in, in crazy you cause me in crazy, you cause me? crazy in love and yeah so it's that country motion thing yeah yeah it's a fun challenge to, to find a note on the top of a voicing and you think, oh, that's a challenge. How am I going to get that to resolve? And then you just move and move and move and move and, and normally you're okay, you know, if you trust, trust yourself. Yeah. You said invest in the emotional exploration of the sounds as, as opposed to the information of the sounds. How do you balance emotional exploration with information? Music has to come from one's emotion, right? But it would be impractical to say, just play what you feel. Absolutely. Yeah, it's that left brain, right brain marriage to strive for, right? Um, it's interesting. I think uh, as a kid, I learned, I, 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 f I fell in love with the sounds of music. Um, I didn't fall in love with, with the labels that, that, that people assigned to the things. And actually, it was only when I was about 17 or 18 that I, I, I learned, you know, that this is a Lydian sound or this is a Locrian sound or whatever, because I, I knew the sound of like, you know, I knew that sound before, I, before someone said, hey, that's a Lydian chord. Um, everyone goes through a phase in their life when they're hungry for information. Right, and I think for me that was between about sixteen and twenty. I was just ravenous; like yeah. I wanted everything. I wanted all the all the stuff. Um, and I think around when I made in my room, um, I realized that in order to make an album that was more than what's like what exists, what makes sense in my own head, which is often very very crazy and um, and complicated, I think I wanted to. If you know, I wanted to find the courage to put my inform the information I'd gathered in across my whole life just to one side for a second, and then just write some songs. And yeah. inevitably, what comes out is information. But my goal was to not build it from the information's point of view, and to just try and let things flow out. You know, um, as far as learning stuff, I remember when I was a really little kid. Uh, my mum has has perfect pitch, and, and she sort of I guess taught or taught me or encouraged me to have that skill by just by pointing sounds out that were around us. You know, like someone's car alarm would go off, or you know the microwave would go Boop, or whatever, yeah. and it'd be like, hey, what note does that feel like? You know, but what note does that feel like? Not what note is that? It's like mm -hmm. how would you know? Look at your emotional framework for one second. I mean, she didn't say this, but this is me translating it. <laughs> it's like, what does that note feel like? How does that note fit in with the way you've built your you know the way the way your memory has 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 organized notes and so you know i might say something like oh that feels like an a and actually it was a d which for my mom that's great because that's close because if you look at the circle of fifths those are kind of the notes in order of color in a certain kind of a way if i if i said it feels like an a but it's an a flat that would be in, now if i looked at that i think that, that was further away than d from the sound of that note um but i think you know i think i loved that process of you know 
I'd, I'd learn a I'd learn a song at school or something that I come home and, and harmonize it. I'd, I'd sing all the parts, um, and I think, okay, so how do I color this in? How can I make this more colorful than it is right now? And then you know, everyone I think everyone's ears find certain sounds like, for example, a, a second or a, or a sixth um, to fill out that pentatonic. That's a, that's quite a natural way of of making something more colorful. And once that's gotten old, then major seventh, and then sharp eleven. And but I didn't call these things these things at the time. They were just sounds. It was like, oh, that's the feeling when it's like. Or well, that's the feeling when it's like that, and and a lot of things that you can't put into words, which is kind of the the, the majesty of music, is you don't have to say everything; you can just do it. Um, so, you know, if you have, yeah, and you add a like a B flat to an F minor and nine chord, that is so warm, and I knew that it was warm before I could tell you that, um, because I'd found it, and I can remember there was like two months where that was my favorite chord. You know, do, 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 ah, everywhere, everywhere, it's great. And I just got, I seeped myself in the sounds that I loved. You know, I loved, you know, like that sound, like Lydian sound. Why is that, why does that feel so good? And why, if I sing this note, do I feel like I'm adding more shine than if I'm singing this note, which is like I'm sitting in the center of the chord? Or, you know, why if I take out that note, is that not as satisfying as taking out this note? And, and so what I built is, a sort of hierarchy, I guess. It's like a hierarchy of what notes have importance in chords. Um, and, you know, as, a, as an all-time lover of harmony, I, I just, my, my, my ravenous nature for information by that stage was, was feeding like an even more ravenous, um, like right brain that was just wanting sensations and wanting things that I could use to express stuff, you know. So this is, you know, this is just so tender or, or I'm arriving here or, you know, I might lead, with voice leading, you might lead somebody to somewhere and then defy their expectation. And the whole thing of defying expectations was, I found it thrilling. Um, and I can, I can tell you a story about that actually a, a bit later on, but it was a, a real epiphany to, to, for me to realize that the reason why I liked music was because it made me feel like stuff. And so, you know, interestingly, when I was, when I was younger, like, you know, 16, 17, 18, like I wasn't the kid with the chops. I was the kid with the ears, you know, so I could, I could feel all this, all this little details in the chord, and, and I'd, I'd get emotional about, you know, one little note in the chord. And it's like, oh, look at that E flat, it's just so lovely and warm. And I was like, come on, man, swing harder, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> um, and it wasn't like that, but I, I think it's hilarious right now because I'm just kind of semi-representing a, a generation of chops people, um, and and for me, it's it's only ever going to be about the reason why that makes me feel something. And it's not that simple stuff is the only way, because for me, the idea of, of promoting or projecting a, a joy of sorts, that is. Joy is a very varied emotion, and it's not just about being pleased. It can be about being angry and joyful, or it can be about being reassured and joyful. Or is that like the kind of joy you get when you leave home and the kind of joy you get when you return home, like so different. And that, in my brain, for some reason, can directly correlate to like a cadence. Okay, so how are we going? How are we going home? You know, are we going? Do, are we going? Do, 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 do. C, every voice rich, oh, rich, so warm, and there's a D in the C chord. Or are we going, you know, or are we going, you know? Because yeah. that's so unassuming, and, and the melody note is the same, you know? And neither of those chords is in root position, so you're, you're never going to feel like you're really, you, you've really arrived, nor have you ever really departed. But, like, I, I, like, I like getting close to those sounds and, and just examining them. Uh, and taking the time to get to know them as sort of my friends or something because it's these characters that move people when they listen to music it's it's the attention to those kinds of details which thrill me um, and so thus I I have invested a lot of time in, in that as a framework and I think once that's established you can gather and gather and gather um, and occasionally you need to remember that you need to remember that why am I gathering so many things oh because because you loved this first, you know, and I know lots of people who have spoken to me about this and, and I think a lot of people can fall out of love with the basic kind of joy of a plagal cadence. It's just so lovely. And the more chords you know, the more courage it takes to not play them. Um, <laughs> guilty. And, um, you know, so I, I think, yeah, I think every now and then it's it's a process of stripping down all the, all the stuff that I've gathered and all the crazy, crazy notes that you've added to chords. Like there's this, one chord I know that has all 12 notes in it. Um, did I have a sort of this already? I don't think so. So this chord is uh, it's like D7, um, but it has every one of the 12 notes. 
and my voice, my range isn't big enough to do the whole chord, yeah. but it goes. And then an octave high, G, B flat, A flat, like that. <laughs> and it's just like, and all the notes are present. Like, I remember when I found that chord, I was like, yeah, you know, it's like I'm, I'm the winner. I found a chord, all the notes in that makes sense. But, you know, like once you've, once I've pushed myself that far, because I'm always, I've always been quite addicted to pushing myself in those kinds of ways. It's like that has no more or less value than something which with way fewer notes in it, as long as you pay attention to the notes in that chord and where they're going because you know the more notes on a chord the more responsibility you have as an arranger or as a singer to to lead them all in the right direction because it's like having like if you have two dogs or something like if you're a triad and two dogs like you can take care of those guys they're going to be fine and they're probably going to stay quite close to you um but if you have like 11 dogs um then just to make sure they're all going in the right direction they all have the, the right amount of momentum and they're all fed the right amount and they're all like yeah. that's really hard um so as an arranger, it's just it's something to think about. You know, the more notes you add, the more momentums you need to attend to, um, and no, no chord with more is is m more valuable than a chord with with fewer notes. Um, but they can sure add some cool colours if you if you learn how to use them. You know, close to you, during the bridge, A flat major. On the day that you are yeah. born, there's a counter mel melody going. On the day that you are born, so it's. Oh yeah. <laughs> Are, I guess the first chord is A flat major. Second yeah. is some sort of A flat thirteen. Yeah. Third chord is A flat six nine major. Yeah. And the fourth chord is F major over A flat. Right. So, the all the chords aren't really functioning in a traditional uh, a functional way. Yeah. So would it be fair to say that voice leading trumps functional harmony yes. in your music? Yes. No, I, I think it absolutely does. Um, the most important thing about voice leading is the resolution, right? Because you can do sound voice leading and then you can end up in some like pothole and it's awful um, but no, those four chords for example you know F major 7 like you know but over E flat yeah. that is satisfying because if you watch every note like the E which is probably slightly quieter than the F yeah. that has motion to go back to the A flat you know so well the E can go either to the, a, to the E flat or up to the F um, and like the D can go up to E flat and the C can stay where it is, right? The A can rise to a B flat. Mm -hmm. So you get do do, and then and then and then and then and then and all the motion in that chord is strong enough to get you back there. Yeah. Um, and obviously the melody do 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 on the day that you were like that's a strong melody, right? That's yeah. just a stepwise up and down. And so that if, if that can stay intact then you can get do all sorts of skullduggery underneath the surface and, and people's ears don't mind because it's strong enough and all the voice leading is leading to something, you know. Why is human voice your favorite instrument? Everybody has one and that's awesome. And everyone has one and every single one, every single one is different. And the voice can do so much. It can be the drums, it can be the bass, it can be the harmony, it can be the melody, it can be textures, it can be weird sound effects and, and, and it can be speech. And it can be, it's 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 a really special instrument because it's so fundamental to us. It's the most fundamental instrument there is. Um, and back in the early days of of the land of Jacob, uh, I only had an SM58, and that was it. And I didn't have a bunch of instruments. And I loved, I loved um, building the sounds of instruments just using the voice and seeing how far I could push that because I found that really exciting. And Bobby McFerrin for me was like a massive hero growing up. There's an album of his with Yo-Yo Ma called Hush. And it's a mixture of, you know, Bach and, and Rachmaninoff and classical music and also folk song and groove and, and all sorts of stuff. And Bobby does that thing where he sings all the parts, but yeah. he leaves them there for you to hear the rest of them. So, you know, he goes like, Dum, you know that where he goes, um, or like the, the blackbird thing, he goes, yeah, you know, and like he does this thing where he lays out the bass and then he does the melody and your ear just knows how to hear what's going on. And I just think that's so wonderful. And he's like a superstar, but he inspired me as a kid to try that. So I experimented with my voice and I couldn't wait to, for, I couldn't wait for my voice to break because then I'd be able to sing like, ah, and I just no <laughs> way I could sing, you know, my, my lowest note was like, ah, yeah. um, and I was, I was actually a bit worried that I'd lose my, my high end, and for a while I did, and then it, it came back, which I'm just feel so grateful for. But, um, 
um, you know, it's 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 amazing because everyone uses their voice every day, and a lot of the language of using your voice is the same with singing and speaking. And someone like Stevie Wonder, like he speaks the same as he sings, You're like hey, blah, 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 you know, because it's just like there's no separation between his singing and his speaking. I love that. That for me, that makes so it makes sense, and that's like the way it should be. You know, does it affect your way of recording things? The voice, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of my recording techniques I learned from the voice, you know, um, and I, I guess with, within the voice, um, the voice category, I'd also say things like, bo like, like body percussion. So, yeah. for example, on, on fascinating rhythm, the clap in fascinating rhythm, that dum, <coughs> that clap is is two claps in each room of my house. Um, one recorded this close to the microphone, and one recorded on the other side of the room. Um, so, yeah, music room, back room, bathroom, bedroom you know, corridors, and I did one in every room of the house, um, and I alternated between left on right and right on left, and it sounds like a group of people, because all the acoustics are different, and the way I'm doing it is different, and the sizes are different, so it's like, <coughs> you know, but there's some close enough, and, and I love playing with that, because there's no end to stuff you can do, you know, there's no end to stuff you can do, and even like a, a, a funny riff on the piano, like some crazy jazz piano line, you know, like I can, I can sing that line, um, and you know, even if I sing it, you know, three or four notes at a time, um, you can achieve that line. And it, it sounds, to me, it sounded more interesting than just playing on piano because playing piano sounds like a piano. In the same way that a chord, you know, if you sing a chord, um, it can feel a, a lot more exciting than just playing it on the piano, just because the voice is so emotional. It's like velvet, you know, and you can you can treat it in all these different ways. Um, you know, I remember last time we talked a bit about this, but you know, if I have a chord and I sing all the notes, then each note is gonna have a different feeling. It's gonna have a different amount of breath in it, you know, from like, ah, uh, to ah, uh, you know, and all, everything in between. That's my palette, you know? And the voice has more dimensions than the piano for me, because it's the amount of breath, it's the amount of volume, it's ah, uh, and ha, uh, and ah, uh, and all of those, you know, variations. With a voice, f for me, it feels like there's, there's, there, it has more capacity for that kind of nuance. Um, and I think that horn instruments like clarinet and saxophone and things, you can achieve that, but I'm not, I don't play those instruments. So I, I guess because I just had that one microphone um, at, the young, at that young age, I, I just tried to do what I was hearing the horns do or what I was hearing the, you know, the, what I was hearing the, the keys player do or something. But I try and do it with voices because I wanted to stretch myself and because I loved the way that it sounded at the end, you know. Yeah, it's my favorite note of the whole arrangement. Yeah. Let's see how I remember that I have a memory of um sitting in the, in the studio with um Herbie and Quincy. Like they came to visit and I, I finished the album, we were mixing it with Ben and we, we played them you and I and, and at that chord, that E flat. That chord. Herbie was like, stop, stop the recording, stop, stop. <laughs> like, no, what is that chord? It was really nice. Wow, that's quite a compliment. <laughs> yeah, I just that like such a precious memory to me, just like Herbie digging. I was like, oh man, 